Okej. Okay. Dobra, wszyscy z tyłu przesiadamy się do przodu, co tak daleko? Nie? No chodźcie, no, serio. Um, I, I count one, two not Polish speakers in the room, so we're gonna talk English, is everyone okay with this? Feel free to ask in Polish if there's any problem or you misunderstand something. Um, I don't know, I'm also very used to the fact that everything related to work is always English, so this is much easier for me as well. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna talk about network automation. Maybe you, maybe you remember I was already here last year in Krakow, I come from Krakow, um, talking about Napalm, um, a network automation tool that we wrote in Python. This is a little bit less... Um, digging into a particular technology now, but I really want to talk about the things that I'm kind of considering on a day-to-day -day basis at work when setting up various systems. And I spent a while um, at various different companies setting up anything from data collection, analysis, S-flow, NetFlow type of things to, to config automation and all the different things that you kind of um, consider doing in your networks. So this is kind of my view on what are the important things to consider when you're trying to set up your network, including the automation part. Um, yeah, nothing more interesting here. So um, we're going to talk about all the different services that you have in your network and kind of the different things that you might want to do and then group them into um, the different systems and talk about how to design them. That's what we're going to do here today. Okay, so different services. What are the kind of things that you would want to automate, you know? And we talk about all the simple tasks. If you just talk about configuration automation, I want to provision my devices, I want to provision my VLANs, I want to provision different con config pieces. But then um, the ultimate goal, obviously, for everyone in every network is to, you know, do all the fancy automated stuff like something went wrong and I can do my failure analysis automatically and I want to do troubleshooting and I want to do consistency checks. The problem is that all the common things are usually pretty, well, they're pretty easy in the fact that they don't rely on a lot of external input. As soon as you want to do something like troubleshooting or like automated routing adjustments, you need some data to base that decision on how you want to adjust your routing. You, you, know, you need some form of rule set that makes the decision for you and you gotta think about how to you know, define, define a clear everything, everything that is Cl every process that is clearly written down and repeatable is in the ultimately automatable, ma automated, well, well, you can automate it um, because you have a clearly defined process. So that's kind of how, where we want to go. Um, okay, so in your network, everything always looks different and for everyone, because you have the, you know, you might have different hardware, you might have different procedures and procedures play a really big role in, in, in network automation as, as I know it, because most of the, you know, uploading a new configuration to your router is technically kind of easy, but integrating it into your process in a way that, you know, network engineers might do pre-checks, might do post-checks, might have a certain procedure they adhere to um, during, during troubleshooting or during maintenances. And really, that's the part that you, that you want to um, consider as well when you set up all your automation systems. Um, so when you think about when you think about the things that you want to do for your network, you know you think about what are the what are the things that I'm doing um, most commonly um, and what takes me a lot of time and kind of just to this would be my priority when thinking about what to automate, which workflow to go first. And <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. That was a fun party yesterday, so I'm a little bit <coughs> uh, difficult here. Okay, and then you end up with a system like this, because you do like a thousand different things, and then Facebook um, presented their their entire automation stack at, at RIPE. Um, what city was that? Bucharest last time? Anyways, at the past RIPE meeting, 
and and then you end up with like this thing and you go like oh my god but they have so many components and and how do you what do you do um so they don't like you know drift apart how do you maintain this amount of components and and so first of all um it, it looks a little bit scary but i really want to i really want to convey that you don't have to be afraid of many components because this is really a good thing um you know, small components dedicated for their task uh, make it possible to like focus on a small thing. Start out small, extend it later on, and have um, you know small maintainable components that really do one particular thing and nothing else. So you don't end up with a big complex system in the end, but you have you know something is wrong with I don't know. <laughs> Something is wrong with draining the services prior to our maintenance at night. And then you really know that it's in this component, drain services, you have to go and fix something and adjust something. And you know you don't end up with this big application where things can go wrong on every corner. Um, which, led me to, which led me to read a lot about microservices. Um, also, because most of my day I actually spend up programming instead of doing anything with networks these days. Well, programming networks to some extent. Um, but so microservices is kind of from, an, uh, from a programming perspective and from an architecture, how you design um, your software. Microservices is kind of the, 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 the concept behind how I want to design my network services as well. Because, you know, they say it should be um, loosely coupled components. They can all be, they can all be written in, in, in different technologies. So a microservice could be something that talks to a database, and a microservice could be a REST API, and a microservice could be something else. But, you know, they all kind of enclose the task around the, the one technology that they use, and that's it. You could use different programming languages for different microservices. You could write one service in Python, the other one in, in Perl, and you could still somehow, you know, because you end up thinking about, um, um, you end up thinking about things like communication between those microservices is something very important because you need to figure out, you know, how does one service get data from another or talk to the other. And um, you end up thinking a lot about how to define this uh, in, a, in a way that you can reuse it, and um, hence it can be different things. So it makes it very flexible to be able to, you know, you, you are able to, um, you're, in the end, you are able to use the technology best for the task, because you're trying to solve a problem, there might be a Python library for it, or there might be something in Ansible, or there might be, I don't know, um, it's something with a database which has completely different components, and if you, if you, if you separate that in a way, you know that you end up with commonly used mechanisms and libraries, each for like their own little task. Uh, you make your system very extendable and you're reusable, if that makes sense. Um, Okay, so all the different tasks that we kind of want to do in our network, you know, and I don't really want to go into them because then we're not going to have enough time, but typically, if you think about automation, you know, one of those things is pretty, probably something that you want to do. Um, the one thing that I want to point out is, is that many of those services rely on the same components. So if you want to provision devices, you're going to need a mechanism to get configuration onto your device. If you want to deploy new customers, you're also going to have to deploy new configurations. And if you want to reroute your traffic, you also are going to have to deploy new configurations. Um, if you want to detect errors, you're going to have to do some form of log analyzing. And, um, and if you want to be notified on for that error, you need an alerting system. If you want to be notified on traffic changes or shifts or you know something something got rerouted somewhere um, you're also going to need an alerting system you know if the alerting system is triggered by something that is a log message or triggered by something that is a um, different um, traffic value that you get in your data set it doesn't really matter so uh, you need one alerting system that you can use for different services and different tasks in your network and that's kind of the way to 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 structure um, this, so you don't end up, you know, with the one bash script that 
uses mail at the very end and sends you a notify email somewhere or with on, uh, ultimately you're doing the same thing in your Python script as well, but if you have a system that can send a notification and you can trigger it with some specified way, you can reuse that from many, many different components. Um, okay, but so from all the tasks that you have, you kind of want to decide what tasks you really need first, um, build the different components that they rely on, and make sure that you can reuse th those components in in different systems. We'll we'll go we'll go through all the different systems one by one now, and kind of well the different systems as I define them to be in different categories of systems. Um, so ultimately, every single task that I ever automated in a network falls into those six categories, each of them. Like, no matter what you want to do, each of them is somehow related to one of those things. Um, okay, so if you want to, you're always going to need a source for your data. If you want to configure your router, you're going to need to, you know, know important configuration pieces that need to go on your router. If you want to set up, um, a graphing library, you're going to need to know which routers do you configure your graphing libraries with. You want to, you know, you want to have, um, oh, what's the graphing library of choice these days, Grafana or something. You need to configure it to pull your particular router, right? So you need a source to um, set up tools, you need a source to configure devices, you need a source for all kinds of different things. Um, this is really where we do like the abstraction of, of the network state. Um, which is something we like to do in like the automation world to be more flexible. To, to I again, it's about reusability. If you abstract your configuration into um, into a set of rules, you can reuse it in different portions. Mm. Okay, we're gonna need something that has access to devices. So either templating. I prefer a templating system. Something that can push configurations to your device. We're gonna need something to do some form of orchestration with. There's <coughs> <coughs> uh, you know, Ansible, Puppet Chef, whatever you like and prefer, something that you can automate your entire workflows with. You're going to need collection systems. And now collection systems, I should have made this bubble much, much bigger because that encompasses a lot. Um, I'm pointing over there because that's the, yeah, everything you collect as NMP, everything you connect as Flow, NetFlow, whatever data you can get, log files, whatever you can get of your um, network kind of has to be collected somehow. But all of those systems have a adhere to the same rules to some extent, because you want to talk to them, get the data out, etc. Okay, you're going to need something for monitoring that detects changes somehow. Where those changes are is a different thing. And you're going to need a template system. Um, um, okay, so each of those now. Um, source DB. Uh, you want to, you know, store, store network data. Um, I've seen many, many different things, and people always go like, oh, but you have to have it in a database, and you cannot have it in a text file, and everything sucks, and should be so much better, and you best have an API to it, and that's going to be amazing. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, I have a text file with routers, and it's fine, too. The important thing about it really is have one of it, you know, don't duplicate it. If you have three text files with your router list, eventually you're going to forget to add one router to one of those three text files and you're going to end up in shit. Um, so, you know, have a defined procedure, you add a, you deploy um, a new device into your network, uh, in that procedure, when do we add it to the one, to the one place that defines our list of routers? Like as an as an easy example, um, the duplicate the duplication example I already took that away. So um, that's how you end up because in all, m lots of the networks that I've seen are like, oh my god, we just added a new router and now it's not in Cacti and it's not in Grafana and it's not in the logging system thing. Well, yes, because you deployed it and added it somewhere and forgot to add it somewhere else. So make it one place. Um, <coughs> You're gonna use so you're gonna use this from from a bunch of systems because you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna deploy tools you're gonna wanna deploy configs you might wanna automate your DNS configurations or whatever else you can do based on your let's stick to the router list example here but it goes for really any portion of um, configuration or data that you have. Um, you're gonna want to reuse that so even if it's a text file you know if you have a 
if you have some two-liner of code that shows you how to get, I don't know, whatever your language of choice is, if it's Python, if you have the two lines that read that text file um, as a little prepackaged function, that's already great. And then in every tool that you write and in every little script that you have, you can use that function to get your router list. And you have one place to get it and one mechanism to retrieve it, and we're done. You know, you can reuse it everywhere where you want to do, uh, where you want to reuse it in your network. I've seen source DBs that look like this, right? I mean, you know, you can have a YAML file, you have your things, you define your interfaces, you def can define your peers, you can define find your IP addresses. If you want to do it in a text file, that's fine too. You can go the way of designing your database and, you know, taking your time, etc., which is okay too. You can extend that, you know, again, provide a script that reads the data out of that database so you can reuse it everywhere and you're golden. So, the, the, the right side over there are all really the important thing par parts to think about when you think about um, where to get your data from. Templating system. You need a templating system. You're going to want to um, generate configurations out of that data, out of that source data that you have. Um, you can, you know, I like to use Ansible with Jinja. You can use custom scripts. You can, any anything goes. So there's nothing really preventing you from, um, you know, coming up with something homegrown that generates your configurations for you. Um, the only thing I really want to stretch, so be device and independent, because you might end up, you know, adding a new vendor to your network, migrating from one router to another. If your templating system is also the system that pushes the configuration to the router, uh, you're going to have to redo the same thing if you ever change anything. So it's kind of have a templating system that only takes care of templates, and, um, and that's a really good start. Also, the other thing is I um, like to use the templating system not only for router configurations, but also for systems configurations. So when you end up setting up graphing software or um, anything else really that you set up around your network, um, I automate those configurations because typically they need to be set up for a particular set of routers. So I take my router lists that I also use for my for my config generation um, to generate the conf uh, for my router configurations to generate the configurations for all the tools and systems that are around the network. Um, okay, you're gonna need access to your device, which can be you know. Again, Ansible does those kind of things. There is a lot of vendor libraries that give you access um, to all the different vendors you really want to talk to. You might be lucky and have a vendor that is easy to talk to. You might not be so lucky and have something that is harder. But um, there's plenty of, of, of scripts and examples and tools out there that, uh, you know, talk netconf or if even talk you know, expect or SSH if they have to and your vendor doesn't provide anything else. But as long as there's some way for you, the things you're going to want to do is upload different portions of configuration. So as long as you can take a file, upload it, and as long as you can, you probably want to automate um, upgrade uh, software upgrades somehow if your vendor comes out with them on a regular basis. Um, so that's probably something you want to include somehow as well. There's there's Napalm on my list here, which I talked about last time, which is a multi-vendor, um, well, abstraction library, really, that talks to uh, multiple vendors and can upload configurations to them. So all of those things really will do the trick as long, you know, as long as you have some way um, to do that. Okay. Collection system. Now that's the fun one, and that's the one that is really that that is probably the tricky thing. Um, so there's the things that I typically collect: uh, device data, so anything that is logs, anything that is. Even if you generate your configurations, I always end up making a config backup anyways, because you you know. You never know, something might happen, and yeah, everyone set up Rancid 15,000 times, and we just set it up over and over again to have something that, you know, periodically uh, makes a backup. You can use other tools if you want to. Um, custom test data, and I'm mentioning that here because um, 
you know, you can have stats and you can have your flow data, but ultimately if you can do some more custom testing on portions of your network, that's really cool. If you can, I don't know, if you have all of your, if you have all of your, like your I internal IP addressing in your source database, um, you can do funky stuff like log into each router and like mesh ping your uh, your entire network, see if everything is still reachable, et cetera, collect that data in, in, in some way. So, you know, there is a lot of services. If you provide services, make sure that your services after any reconfiguration, you could have some form of like post check if your services are still up and running and write that data somewhere too. So you, you know, keep history um, and have that collected somewhere. Um, Okay, graphing data or statistics really, that's the other big thing. There's a lot of tools for all of that out there. Um, typically you wanna, you wanna collect your counter statistics, you wanna, in, this, in, in your first attempt, you really do counter statistics, something with SNMP. There is a ton of tools that you can just set up and they're done. Um, the biggest problem with those tools long term is that you end up setting it up for the five routers you had when you set up the tool and then half a year later it's not up to date anymore, et cetera, et cetera, and no one maintains it. So, you know, consider this, uh, the management of all the tools that you set up um, alongside your network as something that is really part of your network because you're gonna have to maintain that for a long time as well. Yeah, f er earlier, you know, MRTG, now people tend to go to like Grafana or people tend to go to Elk. Um, uh, and I like to think I like to think that that's a little bit of the reason because if you if you use um, Elk Stack or Grafana, you end up having your data in like Elasticsearch or, or or some database that gives you access to it in an easier way than RD tool or things like that used to do back in the day. Uh, and that's one of the things that really people are doing because um, you're gonna need access to that data to automate other things based or make decisions based on that data. You know, you want to be able to, oh God, I remember 10 years ago I had to parse RRD files every like, I don't know, five minutes to see if my traffic in one interval to the other like changed more than 5% or, you know, if you want to do things like that, it's easier to take the data out of a based database than, than out of files. So that's kind of how, why the, the trend of all of those tools is going towards using more um, proper backends. But, but this is the thing that you really got to consider because if you want to do the automated um, failure detection, if you want to do the automated rerouting, if you want to do any kind of things like that, you're going to need data to base those decisions on and you're going to have to get to that data somehow. So sometimes it's not a matter of, you know, setting up Grafana and I'm done and then, you know, two weeks later you're going to be like, oh, but now how do I use this data to some do something smarter with it? Because that's where we ultimately want to go. Um, okay, collection system. So there is the other part to all of this that is kind of making the data meaningful. You always need a front end or you need dashboards or you're going to want to have some CLI tool. Um, it doesn't really matter. A lot of the tools that you're using that you want to use already come with some front end. So you pretty much install that. If you have your data in your database, you can write your own. You can, you know, as long as you have some form of programmatic API access to it, you can reuse that data wherever you want. So you can put it into customer portals or you can use it on internal sites. So you can, I don't know, they make a text message to your NOC engineer that he just had a 20% traffic shifts in some portion of his network, right? So any anything you wanna do which goes really into monitoring at this point. So you want to monitor your collector systems. And the hardest part about monitoring is always you need to know what you want to monitor. So coming up with the rule set and the changes that you're actually interested in, um, that's a hard one. And that is typically something that just comes over time <coughs> as you... Um, you know, uh, you, you do things, ma you operate your network manually anyways. Your network is there, right? It's not like you don't have it. So, um, so as you troubleshoot or as you have any issues that, that repeat in your network, um, you kind of have to think about, okay, so what is the, you know, and sometimes we just do things by like, 
uh, oh, mm, okay, I'm just gonna reroute a little bit this way and a little bit that way. But what is actually that make let, let, lets you make the decision, you know, of like um, uh, moving traffic from like one place to another? Well, typically it has something to do with your with your contracts. Typically it has something to do with your transit, or you have commits here, or you know you need to like send this much over that link at least per month, etc. Those are all decisions that can be automated if you know them. If you know them, if you write them down, that, that's what ends up being your custom rule set, right? Your interface goes down, you want to be alerted on it. Do you want to, no, if it goes down and it comes back up 10 seconds later, maybe you don't care. Maybe it's okay for you to have flapping interfaces. Some people don't care. They have redundancy and something can just be flapping on their networks, so that's fine. Um, so yeah, think about what really are the things that you want to be alerted on and then in a, on you know two pieces of paper what what do i want to be alerted on and then what is the corrective action for each of those things what would the network engineer actually do when he then goes in and changes something on the routers to his tools or whatever um okay and and then the one that i like the most because the orchestration part is really where where all like the powerful things come together. You set up all those systems, and then when you move towards orchestration, you can do all those cool things like, oh, my interface went down, I, I collected that data, now I want to alert on this error, now I want to deploy new configuration to the router that it happened on. This is really like the entire workflow that you that you have to go through. You know, you you edited something in your source data. You want to generate a new configuration out of it. Maybe your process requires for another engineer to review your new configuration before you're allowed to push it to the network. So you want to have a peer review, then deploy it, then wait until the network converges, then do some health checking, and all the all the tools and scripts and systems that you have, this is really where you chain them together. So, so this is really fun. But you know, you need the alerting, you need the monitoring, you need the config generation and templating to, to be able to do any of this. So that's why I'm kind of thinking everything fits into those six categories always somehow. So you want to deploy systems, deploy tools, deploy, deploy custom stuff, do workflows. Um, I use Ansible because I like it. It's very independent and very easy to grasp. But you know, people use Chef Puppet. Pe people do custom scripts. People do things in Jenkins, which is, uh, but okay. Mm. Whatever you, pre you know, I, I hate giving recommendations on tools to use because it's always some very, very personal preference. Like you might have this one person in your team that has used Puppet before. Well, then the entire team goes with Puppet, no question. And it won't make any difference, really, if you use that over Ansible, you know. It's going to end up being the same thing. So, okay, set up some orchestration system. So back to those microservices. So what you really end up doing is you have small services, you define clear boundaries between them, how to get data out of databases and in, et cetera. You have some con communication between those services because they're going to need to talk to each other. You want to reuse those components and you know upload different configs to your router based from different portions um, of your automation system. And you want to deploy everything you have automatically. So those are kind of the things that I want to send you home with here. Also, sitting and not standing has been very comfortable during this. Um, I'm on the last slide here. I'm done. Thank you. Right, right on time. <laughs> Any questions? Any tips for um, storing credentials? for your devices? Oh, the, secure, the security guy. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I just use SSH keys. Who does everything, anything else? I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's, there's radius, there's tack hacks, there's all those things that you can do. Or you, you can, but I, I, you know, network, network groups are usually typically very small, so you end up with like, you know, five people, everyone has, I, I maintain, I use automation to maintain accounts on routers, so like for the five network engineers that we have, 
um, out of the database, the five accounts on the router get generated, and if someone leaves, they get deleted again, etc. So like automate the user creation is something you can do, and then they just all have to generate their SSH key, and that's it. Uh, I've meant the, mm, whenever you have this uh, orchestration tool, like uh, Ansible setup, mm -hmm. and you're doing it through Ansible. So it's in the, in the end, it's accountable to the uh, user that deployed uh, a particular, you know, scri Ansible script mm -hmm. to, the, to all of the devices. Same, same, same thing. Same thing, the, the Ansible list, I have right now, right now on the project I'm on, we have the Ansible kind of like pre-set up on, on one server. Everyone logs in there, everyone has an account on there and runs it from there. And then, you know, of course you have to like, if you want to set up tools and configure your, make configurations for your tools, like you want to, you know, send up, set up, um, Grafana or something, you have to give that tool passwords again, and then those are typically stored in Ansible, and then Ansible has some mechanisms to like not store them clear text in the file, but kind of, you know, hash them somehow and mask them somehow, so if, you, if you're proper, you use those. We always go, <laughs> I always go very hard shell and very soft and fluffy core, so everything can be in <laughs> clear text files. If someone gets onto my ops box, it's probably already bad enough. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's easy when when we speak about routers uh, and hashed uh, accesses or, ha or um, public keys, but on the other hand, sometimes on load balancers or SSL strippers, you need to push um, private keys, customer private keys. Oh, okay. Did you have any situation like that? No, so I haven't done it. You, you have to deploy private keys securely with secure access from your Ansible deployment system and store them properly, st store passwords to unencrypt un 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 that or... <laughs> okay, okay. That's, that's interesting also subject. <laughs> no, I'm fortunately never that close to the customer itself, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks.